Hello everyone and welcome to Know for GCSE. So in this video you're going to find every single exam question on infection and response. Now you're going to be able to access all of the questions on this PDF that I'll put in the description box and it has just the questions and we're going to go through the answers in this video. So let's get started. Just to note that this video will have a lot of content in it so do check the timestamps for specific topic questions. Now let's begin bacteria culture required practical so this is a required practical that's why i formulated it as a six marker explain how to prepare a bacteria culture so what you need to do is you need to spit out everything you know about the bacteria culture required practical and let's look at the answers now so they could ask you about talk to talk about the required practical in so many different contexts that's why i think it's best to learn and memorize exactly every single sub step every single uh, key precaution you're taking so that you can implement that in any form or question they ask so you've got the three stages pre-inoculation inoculation and post inoculation so pre-inoculation you need to sterilize your petri dish and your gel agar gel and this is to kill any unwanted bacteria you're then going to pass the inoculating loop through a flame in order to sterilize other bacteria. So the, the pre-inoculation is basically cleaning everything. So you're cleaning your Petri dish, you're cleaning your agar gel, you're cleaning your inoculating loop. Then you've got the inoculation process. So you're going to use the inoculating loop and you're going to spread bacteria onto the agar gel and you're then going to close the lid of the Petri dish to prevent any microbes from entering and also to prevent whatever culture from escaping. And then post inoculation, you're going to seal it with tape to, as we said, prevent anything entering microbes. And you're going to place it upside down so that the moisture doesn't fall downwards and affect the culture. You're going to also allow the bacteria to grow by making sure that it's kept at a maximum temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. Now, the reason why you do this is because anything higher than 25 degrees Celsius could cause very harmful bacteria because that means that it could then live in our body conditions. And therefore, if it could survive in our body conditions, it's then harmful. Okay, so hopefully you put all of those bits and let's move on to the next topic, viral diseases. So explain why TMV causes stunted growth. So tobacco mosaic virus, this is something you should have learnt about in plant viruses. So it's just a two marker, why does it cause stunted growth? Let's review the answer. So the leaves that have TMV become damaged and the chlorophy chlorophyll also becomes damaged so the plants cannot actually photosynthesize effectively. Now another thing is that the plants do not produce enough glucose sugar for optimum growth so there's two reasons um, or two part reason firstly because the leaves are damaged the chlorophyll is damaged and the chlorophyll is where um, photosynthesis takes place and photosynthesis the byproduct is glucose and you need that for growth and therefore you cannot grow. The second question, explain how measles spreads from one person to another. Now, this is an example of a human viral disease that you needed to know. So pause to answer. So you should know that measles are spread via the inhalation of droplets in the air. And remember, measles are spread via droplets in the air from sneezes or coughs of the infected person. Let's move on now to bacterial diseases. So TB tuberculosis is a bacterial infection. Now explain why people living in a densely populated area are more likely to be affected by TB. This is a three marker. So you've got to use your knowledge to link the um, how close people live together to the chance of them being infected. Let's review the answers. So there is a greater chance of droplets that contain deep TB to be in the air because there's more people and therefore this is a greater chance of inhaling TB. Okay and that next part is just the answer to the next question which is um, give reasons why a person infected by a small number 
of tuberculosis may not develop the disease. And to answer that, it's that white blood cells produce enough antibodies to rapidly destroy pathogens before the pathogens can even reproduce sufficiently to cause any symptoms. So you might not develop the disease because you have a really fast response to it. Let's move on to fungal diseases. So describe how plants become infected with rose black spot disease. It's a two marker. So rose black spot disease is a fungal disease. And this means that any fungal disease you need to know is spread via spores. And this is spread specifically via wind or in water droplets. What could a gardener do to reduce the risk of rose plants getting infected with rose black spot disease? So here you should come up with three ways in which a gardener can reduce the risk of his rose plants getting infected with rose black spot. And use your knowledge that it is a fungal disease. So one way is to remove all the infected leaves and all the infected plants because you don't want it to spread. Another thing is to burn them, and this destroys the spores to absolutely minimise the chance of other plants catching it. To treat all the plants with a fungicide, or to grow plants resistant bacteria, grows to grow plant resistant varieties, so they're so resistant to this fungus, to rose black spot, that they are unable to even get affected. And finally, on the topic of diseases, protist diseases. So this is a six marker. Now explain the different methods to reduce the spread of malaria. So this is a six marker, so let's look at what is entailed in the answer. So you've got non-insecticide treated nets, and this just acts as a barrier to prevent the mosquitoes, which act as a vector for malaria to get to you. Or you can have insecticide nets, which not only stops them, but also kills them in the process. Um, you can prevent breeding in water body sites. You can research and avoid areas with high malarial cases. Wear long sleeve clothes in countries which have it. Close windows, close doors. Use insect repellent. Take anti-malaria drugs up to four weeks before entering that area. And have more regular malaria tests. Okay, so now moving on to the next topic, the human defence system. So now you need to answer this form marker. Describe some non-specific defence systems. Okay, sorry. Let's go through the answers now. So the nose has cilia, which are act as hairs and these trap the pathogens and then you also have goblet cells now goblet cells create or manufacture mucus and the mucus acts as it's something really sticky so it traps more of the pathogens so the cilia and the mucus together trap pathogens now another thing is the skin the skin acts as a physical barrier to prevent anything from entering and lots of healthy microorganisms live on the skin as well um, which help fight off the unhealthy ones and you also have in your skin antimicrobial secretions to kill back pathogens so sometimes on your nose for example it might get a little bit oily and that is actually sebum an antimicrobial secretion and this helps to kill or get rid of any pathogens then you have the trachea or the bronchi, which is just a part of the, the uh, respiratory system. And this secretes mucus and the cilia actually wafts the pathogens to be swallowed. So it gets stuck to the pathogens and the cilia move and wafts the pathogens into the stomach so that it can be swallowed. And talking about the stomach, the stomach contains hydrochloric acid and this kills any pathogen. And another thing is the eyes. The eyes have tears and release tears which actually have antiseptic qualities which means that they can kill bacteria. So let's move on to the next question. What are the three ways white blood cells protect us?
So the first way is that white blood cells produce antibodies. Now, once the antibodies bind to the pathogens, they can then clump together and the white blood cells can then easily locate them. Now, this second part, you don't have to answer in this question, but you may have to use it in another question. So make sure you're aware of how that works. The second thing is that white blood cells produce antitoxins, which fight against toxins. And the third thing is phagocytosis, which is, to, which is when it engulfs um, the pathogen and practically destroys it. Now, another um, way in which our body helps is something called memory cells. Now, every time your body undergoes a disease and is able to successfully fight against it, your memory cells form and they basically remember how your body fought against it. So if you do become reinfected, you are then called immune because your body is able to easily quickly fight it off. Now let's move on to the next question. Explain how platelets work on a wound. So when you get, do get a cut somewhere, this means that very, very small blood vessels or capillaries are cut, which allows your blood to, you know, allows you to bleed out. Now, the tissue surrounding your cut begins to swell. If you've ever, ever noticed when you've cut yourself, that area of your hand or your whatever body begins to swell. And this then narrows the capillaries. So the purpose of it is to narrow the actual capillaries so it prevents as much blood from escaping. Now, platelets in the blood then arrive at the destination where you've been cut and they stick to the edges of the wound and form a net-like structure by meeting in the middle and this eventually is called plugging the wound. Now you have something called soluble fibro fibrinogen. Now this changes into strands of fibrin and these strands act to tangle around the plug and make it stronger. Now you don't have to remember any of those names, they will normally give it to you in a question, but just think there's always something that turns into these strands of fibrin which make it stronger. And then what happens is the whole idea is that the wound is sealed against bacteria from entering and also sealed from blood cells being lost so that can't exit. Now eventually the plug gradually dries out forming a scab which can then give protection whilst the new skin is being formed beneath it. Now just with that last point a lot of people forget to put that the plug the purpose of the plug that's dry the scab is so that it protect, protects a new skin that's being formed beneath it and people can lose one to two marks there so make sure you put that information. Okay then let's move on to the next question. What occurs at each of the four stages responding to a pathogen? Now, there's been so many variations of this question each and every year, and it is absolutely vital that you get your head around it as soon as possible. So, a lot of uh, points here, and the whole purpose of that is so that you're prepared for any question. So, the initial infection by the pathogen you get. And this then causes your white blood cells to start to manufacture specific antibodies. But this is very slow because, you know, it's new. The pathogen is new, so it takes time to create an antibody. And because it's slower than the rate of the pathogens reproducing, the pathogens begin to cause symptoms. Now, large amounts of the antibody will then be released by the white blood cell once they've created it, and it then destroys the pathogens. Now, this reduces a number of the pathogens and keeps them under control. The white blood cell can then reduce the rate at which the antibodies are being produced. So if you are ever feeling ill and you begin to warm up very and heat up, that's because your body is fighting against the infection by producing so many antibodies as quick as possible. Then you can have a secondary infection by a pathogen. So this means that your white blood cells will then begin to produce antibodies really rapidly to destroy the pathogens before it can reproduce again in large numbers. Now, because your white blood cells have already formed the antibody before, so it's got its memory cells, it's much quicker to combat the secondary infection than the primary infection. And then finally, the infection will be under control and the white blood cells will reduce their rate of antibody production until it's completely cleared from the body. Okay, 
Moving on to the next subtopic, vaccination. Describe the benefits to the individual, the family and the wider community of a parent's decision to vaccinate their child and why some parents wouldn't. So this was a bit more of a specific question found a couple of years ago in a paper, but why not practice it? So let's look at the answers to this five marker. So, to the individual, the vaccine prevents the, in, in this case, the context was measles, so it would prevent measles, and there is actually no cure of measles. However, most children already have herd immunity, which just means because so many of the people are vaccinated, that even means that the unvaccinated people are also protected. To the family, they wouldn't have to take time off work to look after their child, they wouldn't have to see their child suffer. And the weak immune system people in the family, their lives wouldn't be compromised. <clears throat> However, a family might not want their child to have an unnecessary infection because that is essentially what the vaccine is. And to the wider community, there's less chance of an epidemic because the child won't be risk to anyone like a pregnant woman or the elderly. Okay, moving on to the next question. So list some advantages and some disadvantages to vaccination. Now, some were listed above, so let's just reveal the answer now. So advantages include that there's the eradication of many diseases and also the fact that it prevents epidemics. But disadvantages include that it's not always effective in providing the immunity and there could be some possible bad reactions after taking it. Now the next question. Explain why the vaccine causes immunity and not the disease. So here you have to think about what is the difference between being immune and having the disease and why does a vaccine do that? So the reason why the vaccine causes immunity and not the disease is because the vaccine triggers an antibody production from your body and the memory cells then remain in your body so that they can quickly produce antibodies in the case of a real infection and that's why you don't get the disease. Suggest so two reasons why children need a follow-up vaccination after three years. Oops, sorry. So, in this question you could answer the vaccination might not be 100% effective. Children are about to start preschool, so the chances of becoming infected massively increase. Okay. And the final one for vaccinations, give reasons why a placebo and a double trial, a double blind trial were used. So just think of the scenario and think of why they might be used. Now, a placebo takes into account the psychological effect. So the placebo effect is when patients believe that their symptoms are improving because they think they have had the treatment when they necessarily not have not, and it's just the psychological effect. And the reason for a double blind trial is to avoid bias from doctors. Okay, moving on to the next topic, antibiotics and painkillers. Explain the process of antibiotic resistance. So in this answer, you need to talk about how to prevent antibiotic resistance, the reasons it's increased over the years. So this is kind of a combination of a lot of different exam questions over the years. Okay, so pause to have a go and let's look at the answer now. So when you start taking the antibiotics, some bacteria are susceptible and those are killed first, but some are resistant due to, you know, mutation and they remain in your body. Now, these are therefore called the resistant bacteria and they then reproduce. And if you take the antibiotic, it will eventually become resistant to that. And that is that is um, how that's the process of antibiotic resistance. And in order to prevent it, you should finish the course of your antibiotics and also prevent over prescribing. And the reasons why it has increased over the years is because of antibiotics being overused. 
there being mutations of bacteria over time and antibiotics only um, working on the non-resistant now. And another question for antibiotics and painkillers, why in the past might people have chewed on the bark of a willow tree if they had a headache? So, different tribal groups, especially the Native Americans, what they would do is they would go to different trees and find loads of herbal remedies for different um, things. And what medicine today has done is just extracted all of the herbal remedies and made sure that's 100% efficient and also safe because, you know, aspirin was one of those um herbal remedies it's found naturally occurring in a willow tree and they used to um, use it as a painkiller and it worked but obviously the other parts of the eating a bark um, were not healthy like you were only supposed to have the aspirin part of it so modern medicine just extracts the chemicals that are needed and that is why they are used instead of herm herbal remedies okay moving on to the discovery and development of drugs so, why can't drugs be used for bacterial infections? Why can't they treat viruses? So, viruses are found inside the cells, and they therefore are inaccessible due to the drug, as if you were to make the drug target inside of our body cells, then our body cells would also damage alongside the viruses. The next one. Explain the stages in a drug trial. So, firstly, you have the preclinical tests, and this is done on computer models and human cells. Then it's moved on to animals. Now, when you see the word clinical trials, this means it's moved on to humans. And the first stage is healthy volunteers. You then move on to uh, trials with the patient having that relevant disease or illness. And finally, the drug is then distributed to the larger population. The next question, explain how clinical trials should be carried out. So firstly, they should be given to healthy volunteers. This should be done at a low dosage to test for the toxicity or the side effects. Then it should be given to patients with that relevant disease. Now, this is done to test for the optimum dosage, efficacy, to check for side effects, to test if it works in a double blind trial when neither the patient nor the doctor knows. So that is more of a specific question about the drug trials, but generally you need to know those points above that. Okay, give three reasons why we must trial drugs. Why is it important to trial drugs? Now this is just in the keywords, so you just need to know for efficacy, for dosage, to check for toxicity, and to check for efficiency. Now, what is the point of a placebo? Now, you can answer this in two ways, because this is only a one marker. You could say the placebo acts as a control, or you can say the placebo is used to compare the effects of treatment versus no treatment. Okay, suggest so why it is an advantage to use synthetic drugs rather than extracting it from plants. So we, we talked about this when we were talking about the herbal remedies, but in a more formal mark scheme format, it says here, because you can produce these synthetic drugs much faster and in sterile conditions in lab systems, the plant drug must be purified first and plants require lots of space just for an effect of volume to be worthwhile. Drug trials are used to find out about dosage. Now, why is it important for the patient and economically speaking to think about dosage? Okay, let's look at the answers now. 
So in terms of the patient, dosage must be sufficient to treat the person without being toxic, because if you have too much of that chemical, it could start to be unhealthy. And economically speaking, to use the least amount for the maximum effect would save costs. And finally, in the initial stage of a drug trial, a small dosage is given to healthy volunteers. Why not patients with the relevant disease at that point? So patients need to take a prescribed drug that has been proven effective and with dosage and with toxicity all in mind. And the new drug may also have side effects that the patients, because of their weakened states, can't cope with. So that's why it's done on healthy volunteers. Now let's move on to monoclonal antibodies. Now monoclonal antibodies is a topic that literally comes up every single year. So memorize these answers because honestly, it will help you so much in the exam. First question, evaluate the personal benefits of using monoclonal antibodies for diagnostic testing. So let's look at these now. So monoclonal antibody testing kits can be used for pregnancy test kits, and these are easy to use, readily available. There's no need to consult a GP, and so GPs can focus on other diseases. You can start to take care of the health of the fetus from an early stage. Urine is much quicker, and it's also less invasive than traditional methods. You know, people could find it embarrassing to have to go to the doctors and discuss personal matters. Also, you could do STD testing with monoclonal antibodies, which again can be done without embarrassment and also can be treated early on so you will have less effects. Now, explain how a pregnancy test works. Let's look at this now. So, as urine passes through the reaction zone, the HCG hormone binds to the HCG antibody in the results zone. So when you're pregnant, you have a specific hormone in your urine, which is called the HCG. And um, what happens is if you're pregnant, this will then bind to the antibody in the results zone. But if you're not pregnant, then it wouldn't bind to it. And because it doesn't bind to it, no dye would appear. But if you were, then blue dye would appear in both zones. There's also a control zone, and this is containing other antibodies. And it's just to show that the uh, pregnancy test, test is viable and trustworthy. Okay, so list some advantages and disadvantages for monoclonal antibodies. So advantages include that it only binds to specific cells, which means that healthy cells are not affected. Another thing is that this can be engineered to treat many different types of conditions. Disadvantages of monoclonal antibodies, however, is that it's actually difficult to attach these antibodies to drugs. They're also very expensive, and as it comes from mice, it also could trigger immune responses. Now, describe the steps to producing monoclonal antibodies. This is one of the most common questions in this topic. So, firstly, you're going to inject the virus into the mouse. This then stimulates the mice's lymphocytes to produce antibodies. Now, combining these lymphocytes with a tumor cell, you will then create a hybridoma and clone the cell. Now, the most easiest and most lost mark in the whole of biology is here. So when people say that you inject the virus into the mice, into the mouse, and then you take out the antibodies, that's incorrect. You're not taking out the antibodies, you're taking out the thing that produces the antibodies, which are called the lymphocytes. So remember, you're extracting the lymphocytes and then combining that with a tumor cell, not the antibodies themselves. Okay, now this pharma question is a little bit specific, so we're just going to skip over this one for now and move on to describing how the monoclonal antibodies and a fluorescent dye can be used to see any pathogens on the slide.
So this is mixing a microscopy question with monoclonal antibodies. And really what's just happening is the fluorescent dye is binding to the monoclonal antibodies and you're putting them on the slide and the monoclonal antibodies will then bind and show up under the microscope because of the fluorescent dye. Okay, describe how injecting a monoclonal antibody can help patients. So what happens is the monoclonal antibody binds to the virus, specifically the antigen. And then this is then complementary to the shape of the antigen. And the white blood cells, known as the phagocytes, then kill the bacteria. So you've got the antibodies, these bind to the virus or specifically the antigen, and this means that the antibodies are a complementary shape to the antigen and the white blood cells can then kill the bacteria by engulfing it. Explain why some people would have a re an allergic reaction to monoclonal antibodies for diagnostic testing. Now the reason why is because monoclonal antibodies actually come from mice and mouse tissue so humans could be allergic to mice. Moving on to plant diseases and defense responses, we're almost there. So suggest how plants have evolved to defend themselves against pathogens and herbivores. This is a six marker, so try to extract everything you can remember. So, you could talk about how the leaves can curl up when touched. Any insect on the leaves then fall off, and that means it's less likely to be damaged and allow pathogen entry. A specific plant called the Ecosia plant has very hollow thorns, which are then colonised by ants. The thorns are sharp and they therefore deter herbivores, and the thorns are large and obvious. The ants that are in the thorns if disturbed, actually attack other herbivores as well. So the ants act as protection. Hairy stems and leaves can also deter animals. And if certain plants contain stinging chemicals like nettles, this can make herbivores think that the plant is rotting. Now, name some physical and chemical plant defence systems. The physical include how you can have cellulose in the cell wall, tough waxy cuticles, the outer dead cells in the exterior, which is bark. So bark on a tree is just dead cells, infected leaves falling off, and this protects the healthier ones. And in terms of chemical defense systems, the antibacterial chemicals, the poisons and thorns and plants, and this helps to deter animals. And talking about poisons, explain how a nettle is adapted for defence and protection. So look at that now. So the stinging hairs, which upon contact, release chemicals, for example, formic acid, and this can leave blurriness and rashes so that animals are warded off. And it also may have thorns, which cause pain to deter the herbivores. And also something called trichomes, which are just these really tiny hair projections. And these lead to inflammation and cause a plant and um, herbivore to appear unusual. Now, what type of defence systems are thorns? Do you think they're mechanical, physical or chemical? Now, you need to know that they're definitely mechanical. Now, discussion on nitrate ions and magnesium ions and what are the two purposes of them. So nitrate ions convert sugar to protein and magnesium ions synthesizes chlorophyll. So they're both quite important. Nitrate ions are important for protein and therefore for growth. And magnesium is important for chlorophyll and therefore for photosynthesis energy and also therefore for growth. And that leads us on to the next question. Describe why a tree needs magnesium ions for healthy growth. Magnesium is required for healthy production of chlorophyll, as we said. And therefore, if there is a deficiency in magnesium, this will lead to something called chlorosis, which means the leaves turn yellow because the only thing turning the leaves green would be chlorophyll. That's not that's not there.
And so the plant will not photosynthesize effect effectively and efficiently, resulting in poor growth. Now, name three benefits of yellow leaves dropping off. We've already looked at one of them, which is that when they uh, fall off, this helps the other leaves and prevents other leaves from being affected. It also means that damaged leaves could be reducing light to other healthy ones. And yellow leaves have some useful substances that can be extracted so the materials can be reused. Explain possible reasons for yellow leaves and stunted growth. So there's a lack of magnesium ions, which as we said, lack of chlorophyll, infection via a pathogen, which means the leaves can become discolored, infections via aphids, which removes the sugar from the phloem, and lack of available light. So the chlorophyll ends up breaking down and not enough glucose to grow. And just moving on to the very, very last question. Why does an aphid's mouthpiece contain sugar after feeding? Well, the reason why is because it pierces through the phloem. And finally, why are aphids a threat to plants? Because they use their mouthpiece to pierce through the phloem and extract the sap, which contains plant nutrients. Now, if you found this long video helpful, then do feel free to subscribe if you haven't already. And um, as I said, this document with just the questions will be available in the description box. Um, I spend a lot of time making these resources, so if you genuinely do like it, um, please tell me in the comments, they make my day. And wishing you all the best for your exams. See you soon.